Well, hey there, folks. Welcome to The Roundup. We're a Cowboy State Daily podcast, and we get to feature interesting people from around the Cowboy State. I'm your host, Wendy Kaur, and oh my gosh, today... Today, our guest is so interesting. We're talking to Tucker Fagan. A lot of you might know Tucker's name. You might know who he is, but I'm willing to bet you don't know all that Tucker has accomplished here in the state of Wyoming, starting off as a kid on the streets of New York. Mrs. Fagan's little boy has grown up to just make all the difference here in Wyoming. Welcome, Tucker Fagan, to the Roundup. It's so good to have you on the show. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, you know, uh, I was so fortunate to have a great mom and dad, five brothers and sisters. My dad was a firefighter there, and I learned the firefighter ethic. And they, they devoted their whole lives to their six kids to, to get us, to help us, to teach us. It just, I, I was so thankful of what they did for me. So, uh, and, and the fact that I'm in Wyoming or, or got here is just, you know, I, I can't imagine it, uh, but I've had a great life, great things, uh, great people to be around. Hey, and I, I admire so much what you're doing, you know, with Dr. Joe McGinley, uh, Rob Wallace, uh, Chuck Box, Candy Moulton. And I know all those people. That's because <laughs> you you run in the right circles. You run in the right I, circles. In New York, I never would have met people like that. Right out, I had a job. Uh, I was a teamster. That's how I got through college. Uh, no uh, kidding. I worked uh, at the AMP warehouse, which did all of the five boroughs of New York up to Albany, half of Connecticut, half of uh, New Jersey. Uh, so I was a laborer. And that's really what happened to me is I get my degree and I, here I am, four years of college. I go, I move boxes. That's what I do. And, and my family there, you know, firefighters, cops, people like that. I don't know what to do. It was 1967. So I joined the Air Force. It was the height of Vietnam. They sent me to Cheyenne, Wyoming. So yeah. my, first, my first job in the Air Force was here in uh, Cheyenne. I was a missile launch officer. And I was a kid from New York, from the streets. And, you know, and, and I didn't know about rodeo. I didn't know about cowboys. Didn't know about any of this. And I was kind of introverted and shy. So I kind of stayed in my room. And I didn't plan to do this. But I eventually memorized the entire missile system I, I i i could write out the entire circuit breaker protection chart from memory i could write out every control airline every hydraulic line every switch every light every piece of equipment i knew it all and and what was kind of cool was then uh i got a call from a colonel and he said he worked at the joint strategic target planning staff in omaha they're the war plan builders and he said, uh, we, we heard about you, Fagan, and there's four Air Force and four Navy, and we want you to be one of them. So you're going to come here to Omaha, and you're going to build a war plan. And I did that for the next five years. And, and the same thing. I went there saying, you're going to pick me. I'm going to do my darndest to know every weapon, where it is, how big, how fast, could it penetrate enemy defenses? Why would you use a Poseidon weapon on this kind of target or a Trident? or a Miniman 2 or Miniman 3 or B-52 or FB-111 weapon. That's what we had at the time. Why would you use that weapon on that target? What's the objective? How do we accomplish that? What's the best mix of target to weapon to accomplish the objectives that we got from the president and the secretary of defense? And eventually, I knew just about, I knew every option and what was inside that option, whether they were you know, submarines and bombers or submarines and land-based weapons. I knew, I knew in my head. I get a call from another colonel. He's in the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. He said, hey, Fagan, we heard about you. We want you to come here and take over the nuclear warfare branch for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Holy and, dang. And there that job was, it was pretty cool. Because I was responsible to teach civilian and military people about the war plan and how it worked and how it fit together. And one of the primary jobs was to create the black bag, which is called the president's football. And inside of it is the war documents. And I did that for President Ronald Reagan. And I had the opportunity to go over to the White House and teach President Reagan. Awesome, awesome guy. 
And I'll tell you that story. Please do. Uh, yeah, no, we want to hear that story because you told me the other day and, and everybody needs to hear that story. Okay. So I was told, hey, be ready on any day. You have to be ready. We're going to call you. you. You be ready. You get over the White House. So anyway, it uh, snowed about a foot in, in northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. That's catastrophe. I mean, two inches of catastrophe in D.C. So anyway, I go out my driveway and I uh, shovel out my Volkswagen, jack it up, and put chains on. Go back inside. I'm taking a shower. And my wife starts beating on the door. Get out here. You you get out here. It's the White House on the phone. I said, hey, I'm all wet. Just tell them, get the number. I'll call them back. Don't worry. You know. And at that time, you know, the phone was next to the bed. It was attached to the wall. So they're hearing all this. <laughs> she goes, no, no, you you get out here right now. So I, I go, I take the phone. And the guy says, okay, uh, you're on at uh, three o'clock. Uh, we have a Secret Service four-wheel drive vehicle. We'll come and get you. We have a Secret Service cat. We're going to get you. We have a helicopter on alert over at Andrews. We're going to get you. I said, well, I bought this Volkswagen in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And once you put chains on it, it's, it's pretty much a beast. <laughs> and I said, how about this? I'll head up that way. I was 16 miles away from the Pentagon anyway. I'll head up that way. And if I get stuck, I'll give you a call and you guys come get me. So anyway, I got up, up to the uh, Pentagon, got my stuff, went over to the 14th Street Bridge in that little Volkswagen. I had classified material that... that that most people have never heard of. So anyway, I get over to the White House, go in, stay, go in the uh, east side door, downstairs into the Presidential Emergency Operations Center. It's a really cool command post in, in the basement of the White House. So I'm in there, and I'm, I'm on this side of the table, and on that side of the table is Admiral Crowell. He's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, there's the Secretary of Defense, Casper Weinberger, and the Deputy for National Security, General Colin Powell. So I'm on this side of the table going, Tucker, don't let your brain and your mouth go into hyperspeed. Just calm down. Just calm down. Door opens. President comes in and goes, damn, their room's in here I never even heard of. <laughs> we just all laughed. We, we, he put me at ease. I go, he's just like all my, my family, my friends. He's just like them. And he was one of the coolest people to be around. He and Casper Weinberger were my, like man and wife. One would start the sentence, the other would finish. I was so impressed with how they had worked for, together for so long. They had such love for each other. They knew each other, how they thought and what they were doing. But anyway, when I finished the briefing, he turned to Weinberger and said, we go to war. This is a guy I want to talk to. And I said, that's my job. Know every weapon. Know if your position's under attack and how much time we have with you. And we'll, we'll count that down if you're under attack. If you're not under attack, we'll have plenty of time to discuss it. But we'll tell you, you know, the characterization of the attack on the United States, what the best, best available option is right now, and we'll turn it over to you, Mr. President. So, so wow. here's here the son of a firefighter from New York. Went to a school you never heard of. I'm in the White House, and, and my grandparents came from Ireland. They were maids and, and workers for very rich people in Scarsdale, New York. And we, you know, we were the poor family in that town. But I'm in the White House. That's America. Okay. That, that is America. Because that's so true. The plan, and out of 23,000 people who work in the Pentagon, I'm the one who is sent over there. So my you, know, you just you never know where life is going to take you. But that's my secret is. Whatever job you have, you do the best. You do absolutely the best on that job. Know everything about it. And then number two, have a sense of humor. That's, that's right. Key. Yes. So key to be, you know, that's what people want to be around. Other people who, and it's like the firefighter ethic. I'll stand with you. Good times, bad times. I will never walk away from you. You, you, you are it. Okay. That is so key. And that's what I found in the military too. And, and in this here in Wyoming, you have that same thing. Uh, so many good people that uh, work with you. God, I mean, the 90 legislators that when I was working, you know, with the Wyoming House and Senate, just great people, governors, the, you know, staff there. I, I, I just can't tell you uh, what a great place this is. And I tell my brothers and sisters, you, you ever try to go see the governor in New York, 
there'll be 15 people in front of you. You will never see that governor. Here you come in our uh, Capitol building, come in, turn right, walk down the hall. The doors open at the end of the hallway. You go in there. He can see you. You, you don't get that anywhere else. You don't. You, get don't. you don't get that anywhere else. And it's like what we were talking about earlier, Tucker. The people that you meet in this state are amazing people. They're they're best selling authors, and they are mountain climbers, and they are, like you mentioned, the politicians. We can go talk to our politicians anytime we want. Our representatives in Congress, we have access to them in ways that we that other states don't. And it's such a blessing to live here in Wyoming, which I'm sure is why you chose to come back here as often as you did. You made you made sure you made your way back here to Wyoming. Tucker, tell us how you got back to Wyoming. Well, uh, after I was one commander at the, at the Air Force Base, which that's a cool thing too. When you start out there and you come through the front gate as a second lieutenant, you're going like, do, do, do I even fit in here? What What's this job like? What are these bosses like? Are they good? Are they bad? Do they yell at you? What What are they like? You know, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, uh, years later, I come back as wing commander and you know, I had the same feelings coming back in and remember that this time, of course, I had two dogs, four kids and a wife. <laughs> that was different. That is different. <laughs> yes. That makes a bit of a difference. Well, I first got here. Anyway, so after I was wing commander, I go back. I worked at the Pentagon. I was working for the uh Chief of Staff of the Air Force, uh, General Tony McPeak, who was kind of a, a different sort of fellow. But anyway, I got a call from the uh, first, uh, oh, he's the second 20th Air Force commander. And he had just moved 20th Air Force from California to F.E. Warren in Cheyenne. And he said, hey, Tucker, uh, I'm looking for a vice uh, commander. You know, would you come back to Wyoming? I said, I have two kids at the University of Wyoming. You would bring my family back together. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I came back here and I did it for uh, four and a half years, three different uh, uh, commanders I worked for. And uh, so by law, you have to retire. It's not like you can say, I'll just stay forever. No, there's a certain time period you have to leave. So my time period came up and thankfully, uh, Governor Geringer uh, called me and said, hey, I, I want to hire you. I got a job for you. And it was uh, director of Department of Commerce. So I retired mm -hmm. from the Air Force on a Friday night, Monday morning. I started in commerce. And the task, no he gave, <laughs> the task he gave was reorganize what is in the, the Department of Commerce now. And so I built the plan for uh, state parks and cultural resources, ran it through the House, ran it through the Senate. Governor signed it. And I was the first director of uh, state parks and cultural resources, which that was a great job to great people, really. Awesome. So the the Department of Cultural Resources, I mean, state parks, okay. we all, we okay. all benefit you from record that. that. We almost made the mistake of calling it Cultural Resources and Parks would have been CRAP. Okay, so I'm so glad you didn't do that. Oh, Don't my gosh. That. Okay, this is good. So, yeah. So, so we did it, State Parks and Cultural Resources. Very smart. But we all benefit from that. There's state parks everywhere in the state of Wyoming, and we all use them. But you are the one that organized it. You were the first one that started that. And and that was not your the end of your time, though, working for the state government. No. And then a couple of months later, I got a call saying, hey, the Wyoming Business Council is really having a problem. You need to go down there and fix it, which I said, I don't know what economic development is. I never thought of it. So he said, just go down there and get it going. So I did that for the next eight and a half years, uh, you know, and, and, you know, it was a tough job in the sense that, you know, everybody goes, what do we need to do, you know, to diversify the economy, to grow the economy. And, and a lot of people have ideas, but then the implementation of that is a, a really important part of it. What I, my first staff meeting, I said to the staff there was that, uh, you know, we're on the front of the newspaper, you know, uh, displaying all sorts of stuff, you know, promises probably can't keep. I don't believe in that garbage. Here's what we do. I want to work. And a year from now, if somebody in Cody stops Hanko, Senator Hanko in the hardware store and says, hey, those guys are actually doing stuff. That's what I'm after. So that's what we started doing, work in the background of work. And we funded Small Business Development Center, the Research Product Center, the uh, uh, all tools that could help existing Wyoming businesses grow. 
we only spent 2% of our budget on recruiting because to me, that was like a lottery ticket. You know, a lot of companies would come to Wyoming and say, wow, no, no corporate income tax, low unemployment insurance rates, low, you know, you're heaven. We, we would, we want to come to Wyoming and, they, and we would show them, you know, different communities and, you know, places where they could land. And they'd say, hey, we want product out the door in six months. And we'd have to say, you give me 18 months, I might get a road out there. That's where, that's where Wyoming was back then. So that's where we went to the legislature and said, hey, we need to start building the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure that a company can come and say, okay, yeah, there's a business park. It has water, sewer, power, broadband. It has all the things I need to, to, to come and, and start building it. And I think the fruition is coming now where you see, especially around Cheyenne. I mean, they have giant uh, uh, data centers here now. And, and you look at Casper, what, what they've done with their business park and, you know, and look at even Cody at the end of the runway there. Uh, I mean, that's where we didn't have that before. And that's where we needed the physical infrastructure built. So you, you do it incrementally to prepare, you know, uh, people for that. And, and I think, you know, uh, again, the state is growing. Is it going to be massive? No, it's not. You know, there is some limitation. If anything, our, our problem right now is having adequate workforce, which, again, that's back to the old problem of we, we educate kids and they, and they want to go somewhere else. And my kids did that, too. My two older boys, you know, they went to UW, went down to Denver, worked for uh, tech firms down there. Then they came back. OK, because they knew what it's like. Because they know what it's like here in, in, in Cheyenne. And, and that's what to me is so good is you, the, sure, go out, go somewhere else, figure it out, come back, bring your expertise, bring the education you've had, bring that family connection, you know, bring that honesty, decency, you know, level headedness. That's what Wyoming is known for. And teamwork. That's what we do here. That's so important. And, 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 and you don't find that in other places. You find the stabbers and the backers, that kind of garbage. You don't get that here. This is why we have something so good. And I'm so happy that my family was a part of this and, you know, working for the Air Force, working for state government, and then working for Cynthia Lummis, you know, eight years as her chief of staff. Yeah. I, I had the greatest time. That, that person knows this state up back sideways i'll put her up against anybody you don't see her in the in the news a lot you don't see the pictures all that she's just like senator mike Enzi. she's a worker in the background all right you know mike Enzi. mike mike was mike was a great guy oh my gosh and he did not draw attention to himself he whoever went to mike, did the work. if you ever went to mike Enzi's office if you started a bill got it all the way through and the president signed it they had a, an original copy and they would frame it. Mike Enzi had more of those on his wall than any other senator. And people from Wyoming didn't even know it because he would not tell you. That's the kind of people we are. And that's where Cynthia Lummis is too. The background workers, the people who try to get stuff done, work with people, you know, across party lines, you know, a lot of animosity, but there are background workers up there in Congress, and she's one of them. That's fantastic. How did you first meet Cynthia? Because like you mentioned, you were with her from 2007 to 14. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, when I was in the business council uh, on the estate loan and investment board, they meet, you know, once a month. I was first on the agenda for that. And, and what I learned in the Air Force is I, and I was bringing business ready community projects from communities around the state. And, and what I learned in the Air Force, you don't just go to that meeting and go, well, here it is. Uh, you guys vote for it. See, ya. what you did was 10 days before I would go to the governor, the secretary of state, the superintendent of public construction. Right. And, and uh, the, the auditor and the treasurer and say, here's the game plan. Here's what I'm going to be presenting you know, next Tuesday at the uh, SLIB meeting. Uh, so here it is. Here's the reason for it. Here's why we're doing it. Vote for or against it. That's your job. My job is to get it all together, work with that community, and we think this is the best plan for them. And so, you know, I got to know all of them on a very personal level. And obviously, Cynthia was one of them. And so when uh, she was running for office, she said, hey, uh, uh, would you come and help me? And 
after that, she said, would you be my chief of staff? And so again, I go like. Back, you went to Washington, D.C. Actually, not so much. Really? I told Cynthia, I said, hey, Cynthia, I have moved so much. I had one kid that went to four high schools. I have my family now all in Cheyenne. I'm done moving. I'm done. She said, okay, why don't you do this? You be the chief of staff, but stay in Wyoming. But run the run the staff up in D.C. and run the state staff. And here's this is cool. Uh, Boehner, who was a, a speaker of the House, found out she was doing that. She He told her, I want you to teach all the new people coming to Congress. That's the right way. He said, I see my chief of staff maybe six, seven minutes a day. And that's running in front of him, going back here, going over there. I know he picks you up every uh, Friday night down at the airport, drives you up, goes around the state with you, drives you back on Monday morning. You probably have more time with your chief of staff than anybody else in Congress. You're doing it right. We're all doing it wrong. That's so great. Oh, my gosh. So I was, and a lot of people said, well, you must have been in D.C. all the time. Well, I did do seven years at the Pentagon, but so I do know D.C., and, and I do know the area, but uh, uh, I was here. It, it was it was so much better. It, and, and we would, you know, driving up and down or, you know, driving into Jackson, driving to Casper, driving, you name it. We had the greatest discussions on everything on policy, on family, on religion, on, on natural resources, on you know, one time driving from Manville to Hartsville. She goes, what's that over there, Tucker? I'm a city kid, right? I go, uh, grass? She goes, no, that's the grass for That's the best forage in the entire United States. It's on Hageman's Ranch right there. Look at that. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's fantastic. I learned so much stuff like that. It was the greatest time. You have lived such a unique and interesting and multifaceted life from the military to government service and things like that. What has been, when you look back, what has been your favorite time? I, 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 life is it. It's now. It's it's then. It was uh, here. I'm in the White House with the President of the United States. It's uh, with my mom and dad playing stickball in the street. Uh, it's, uh, uh, God, I... I, I to me, each new step, it just seemed like it was good. And it was good because I was around honest, decent, good people who I helped and they helped me and we worked together. And, you know, all those jobs I got, I, I tell you this, I never asked for one. It was people who recognized the job I was doing, building the war plan or doing the black bag or doing, uh, you know, a, a commerce to uh, the business council and say, hey, and then to Cynthia saying, hey, would you come help me and work with me? So I didn't have to ask for that job. They they came to me because they had heard about me and they or they saw me and they said, OK, hey, I, I like being around that guy. We have fun. We, we do the job and have fun at the same time. But something that you'd said earlier, and you and I talked about this last week when we visited just real briefly, is that secret for success. That secret for success is know your job know it backwards, forwards, be the expert. And that, in in your opinion, and, and I, I, I we kind of joked at the time, I said, you know, we're going to get a Tucker Fagan TED talk here. But that is your, your recipe to anybody who wants to excel, who wants to succeed, whether it's business, whether it's uh, their, their political ambitions, anything, be the expert. Tell us, tell us more about that. It, it, that's it. You know, going into building the war plan. You know, I looked at that and saying, OK, there's somebody just like me in China and Russia. They may be smarter than me. They may have went to better school than I went to. They're not going to outwork me. I am going to learn every weapon. I'm going to learn why would you use it? Why would you not use it? What's the best way to build these options that we've been asked to do? Uh, those kinds of things. So and there were, you know, seven other people who worked with me. And I'd say one or two of them was kind of close to that too of learning everything else but then you know two or three of them were just like well this is just a job and you know i i i, I show up in the morning i do a little bit of work and then i go home at night you know to me i lived it i lived that plan all right same thing working with the joint chiefs i lived that plan to say if i'm responsible to teach the president to teach the chairman 
the Secretary of Defense, the uh, uh, and then there's a list of, of four stars who could take over for the chairman if he or she is incapacitated. So I'd have to go, you know, the commander in chief of the Pacific, commander in chief of the Atlantic, commander in chief of Europe and go teach them too. So here I am, a kid from the streets, again, Mrs. Fagan's little boy. And I'm going to these places, going in to talk to those four stars and laying out, here's your responsibility. You know, one of the best ones, commandant of the Marine Corps. Yeah, I, just a good person. I mean, just so such a pleasure to be around people like that. Uh, and I was teaching them. So you go like, okay. And, and then, and, you know, here working in the state and, you know, I think I did a good job at state parks and cultural resources. And they say, Hey, you, you need to get over the business council. It's, it's crashing and burning. <laughs> you need it's to a fix- size success. You, you, you start something and say, Hey, you're doing so good there. We're going to pull you away from it. We're going to get you to, to help here too. And that's kind of been your recipe then, because you were able to go in and be that problem solver. You went to the next, to the next place. What was your, so what was your last job that you have done that you maybe got paid for, I guess. What was the last position that you held before you uh, retired? Uh, well, it was, uh, we'll work for Cynthia Lummis. Uh, okay. I, I did, I did work for uh, Mick McMurray. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome person. Uh, I, I, did, I was on two boards of directors that Mick asked me to be on. I love Mick. Okay. And there again, there's people in this state that do so much that people just don't know. God, God, I love Mick. But you're still busy, Tucker. I mean, you are a guy, you're out there. What are you doing right now in your quote unquote retirement? <laughs> well, I work with, in a way, I'm going to advise my two sons, but they don't need much anymore. They're, they're, they're where they are. You know, I, I, I've done a lot for Shine Frontier Days, uh, but, but ah. I kind of pull back because I, I go like, you know, uh, like in, in many of the things in Frontier Days, which is really a, a good thought that you, you don't be there for like 10, 15, 20 years. Greeley Stampede, that's what they do. They, they, get a, they get people on their committee. They never get off. Where in Frontier Days, you usually do a, a job for like three years. And I've had a lot of those I've on, on the board of directors. And I'm proud of this. I was chairman of the board of directors of Shine Frontier Days. Kid didn't know diddly about rodeo and i'm eventually that and, and i'm proud of this i'm in the shine frontier days hall of fame how, right. how that happened how that happen, a kid from new york who's never I, who never rode a horse probably before he came to wyoming of course not. the only horses we saw were the cops and they were oh big horses, and we were afraid of them <laughs> you but but you mentioned and we just touched on it you have held a number of positions at cheyenne frontier days not just on the board but also with the foundation tell us about your your relationship with frontier days okay uh i, I couldn't say no so i was chairman of the uh, cheyenne frontier days city of cheyenne joint powers board the cheyenne frontier frontier days building authority the uh I was president of the for eight years the uh, crisis fund which is awesome the thing that helps people, you know, if, if you have a fire in your house or a bad accident or you lose your job, we would go in and pay your uh, utility bills, pay your mortgage or your rent for six months, that kind of thing. And we would have amassed the money and then go help them. I mean, it's, it's a great charity. So if you work for Frontier Days, you're a volunteer and something happens to you, you lose your job, bad accident, whatever that, we're going to take care of you. I mean, awesome jobs like that. Uh, so on the foundation, I was uh, uh, one of the original members on the board, and eventually I was chairman of that board. And then they, uh, Tommy Hersey called me back and said, hey, would you put together the entire foundation? So I said, Tommy, wow. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my late 70s. If, if my brain was still working like it used to, I'd be working for Cynthia again. But, but, but I'm just not there. Uh, so I'll, I'll give it a shot for two months. And I did that, and and one uh, uh, Sunday, I'm like, I'm cooked. My brain's cooked. You know, so I went to Tommy and said, hey, I, I love working for you, Tom. I love doing this, but you know what? I just don't have the capacity to do it anymore. So I pulled back from all those things. I was on the board of directors for a line. I was on a board of directors for Laramie County Community College Foundation. So it was just like, I'm cooked. You see, it, it seems to me, Tucker, that you have to be involved. This is what you evolved to be 
after you said, you know what, I'm going to Teamsters, I can't just sit and, and collect a paycheck and do a job. I've got to be doing something meaningful. And so Tucker, it seems like that to me sums up your life. You want to do meaningful things and you're continuing to do meaningful things even after your retirement. Well, in a way, yes. Yesterday I was up in Casper, you know, interviewing and working with kids who want to go to West Point, Annapolis and the Air Force Academy, which wow. is cool. Which is a cool thing because, you know, uh, I've been doing that. I did it all years of Cynthia. I did it for two years for Cheney. And now I'm back with Cynthia again. Uh, so, you know, things like that. And I, I mean, you see these young kids from Wyoming. We're, they're the exact young people we want in our military. We want them to be the leaders. And, and, and I want them to be chief of staff of the Army 20 years from now, chief of staff of the Air Force. And they have that capacity. You, you know, I worked for a, one chief of staff of the Air Force. He told me the absolute best pilot in the United States Air Force. Nobody could touch this kid. He was from Guernsey, Wyoming. No kidding. The best pilot in the United States Air Force. Wow. Oh, my gosh. So here's the thing is you have rubbed elbows with all of these people who are household names. And yet you choose to live here in Wyoming. Just to wrap things up, Tucker, tell me about what lies ahead for you here in Wyoming, the state that you have loved, that you have chosen, that you've chosen to raise your children and to bring your children back to. Tell us about what's next for you here in Wyoming. It's just you know participating and, and helping. And if I see something that needs to be done, I'll, you know, I'll help out with that. Uh, let me go back. Uh, a lot of people don't understand what real leadership and management is. It's humanity. 99.9% .9 of people come to work every day to do a good job. If you're the leader, the manager, you recognize that. And I learned that in the warehouse, that if you, you create the environment where people want to come to work, it is easy. If you're a screamer, you're a demeanor, you yell at people, you are not a leader. You are not a manager. You're a nothing. You you are a negative influence on your organization. And 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 I see so much of that in Wyoming. You know, the leadership, I, I, the people I work for in the house, Grant Larson, you know, Hank Coe, people I God, just great, great people that Clarine Law. Clarine Law was the first person running a committee that I had to go brief you know, in committee, and nobody told me how to do it. Clarine was the chair, and she helped me so much. And I would say years later, I'd say, Clarine, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for rescuing me that day, because you knew I had no crap an idea how to, how to testify in that committee. Clarine Law, what a great person. You, you knew her too. I mean, how many times would I would go, and of course, we'd stay at the Antler Inn whenever we went to Jackson. I'd get in there at nine o'clock on Saturday night. Who's behind the desk? Clarine Law. No we kidding. Oh. She's working there. Great person. I mean, people like that, where you, you, you see they touch you, you touch them, you go like, good God, I'm so fortunate. We are all fortunate. We're all fortunate to live here in Wyoming and work here in Wyoming because here you can make dreams come true. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be from someplace outside of this state. You can make all your dreams come true and succeed from the ground up if you're here in Wyoming. And that's you and I both. We talked about that right before we got on, right before yeah. we got on this, this call. One more point. If you think you're an outsider, it's because that's your brain. You are not an outsider. You just do your job, take care of your family, take care of yourself, be honest, decent. You will be welcomed, okay? You will be welcomed. Awesome. Tucker, this has been such a fun conversation. This has been such a fun conversation. Thank you so much for your wisdom, for your experiences, for telling us your stories. I know you've got so many more stories. And I tell you what, next time, folks, you run into Tucker Fagan, have him tell you more stories because he's got a lot of them. Tucker, hey, thank you. Thank you. Well, you're doing Wyoming. You're doing such a great job for Wyoming. Thank you. You bet. I am glad to do it. And folks, thank you for tuning into the roundup today. We have had such a fun conversation with the amazing Tucker Fagan. 
And we've got so many more great conversations coming up. So stay tuned next week for another great guest. Until then, I've been your host, Wendy Kaur. Have a wonderful week. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you, Wendy. You're awesome.